For the first time in human history, the sky became a battlefield on a scale never seen before, nor after the Second World War. Allied planners went to great lengths to break Hitler's Germany from the air, and in response, the Germans went just as far to make sure they couldn't. What followed was such carnage that, quote-unquote, to catch a flak, became a term still used to this day. And now you're going to understand exactly why. Okay, so for everything to make sense, let's start from the beginning, then move from there, logically and chronologically. In the years leading to World War II, all sides that would soon be fighting each other were doing their own thinking about how the new way of combat would look, and they were preparing their armies according to that. But practice is often different from theory. In the previous global war, it was proven how important aviation is. So both the United States and Germany tried to find the best way to employ military aircraft. Americans were particularly fascinated with heavy long-range bombers, and the idea that, with them employed in so-called strategic bombing, the war could be won, maybe even without setting foot on enemy country's soil. They thought that if you drop enough bombs over a country's infrastructure, its ability to wage war would be completely destroyed if it didn't have fuel and factories, and the ground forces could then march in to mop up. This led to the development of the soon-to-be legendary B-17 Flying Fortress. It had revolutionary range and bomb payload for the time, and on paper it looked more than promising. However, the Germans were doing preparations of their own, in complete secrecy, despite the ban on developing weapons under the Treaty of Versailles. German military strategists under Adolf Hitler were anticipating the threat from new heavy bombers and were working on a counter for them. They didn't put much effort into heavy bombers of their own, nowhere near as the Allies did. Germans focused on medium and dive bombers, and they created cutting-edge fighters like the BF-109, which was literally the best fighter in the world when it appeared. And of course, they came up with new anti-aircraft cannons, commonly known as FLAC. This stands for Fliegerabwehrkanon, meaning aircraft defense gun in German. Watching the capabilities of new American and British bombers, the Germans knew that their industry was threatened. So the soon-to-be biggest enemy of Allied bombers was now developed, the Flak 18, better known as the 88. So let's now say something about it and why it was so special. The 8.8 centimeter Flak anti-aircraft cannon would be developed from a proven German World War I cannon in the same caliber. It would then be continuously upgraded throughout the war with higher velocity shells and better optics and systems around it. But the core idea at the time was revolutionary and basically no one else in the world had anything like the German Flak 18. The cannon was mounted on a cruciform carriage that gave it quick traverse and elevation from minus 3 to plus 85 degrees, so almost completely vertical, so it could engage pretty much any target on the battlefield, from land to air. It weighed about 7 tons and was manned by a well-trained 10-man crew. They could put their cannon from transport into fighting mode in just two and a half minutes, which was important for Blitzkrieg tactics. They first saw combat in Spain, and the Germans knew they had a very effective modern cannon, not just for the anti-aircraft role, but also quite capable in anti-tank, anti-fortification, and basically anti-everything-you-want-to-destroy roles. Because of their good optics, combined with a flat firing trajectory and high velocity, because of that, they also got armor-piercing shells, and a new branch of anti-tank guns based on the flak would be developed in parallel, but that's another topic. This gun had to reach new bombers now operating above 20,000 feet, where Allied military planners thought they would be safe from standard anti-aircraft weapons and fighter interceptors of the time. Well, the Germans were about to ruin this expectation when they developed a new, very effective high-velocity gun. The idea was that time-fused anti-aircraft shells would reach the bomber's high altitude. Because a direct hit at such distance with the technology of the time was achievable only with luck, they would explode around the bombers, with time fuses carefully set to explode at the right altitude, and the shrapnel would go in a wide circle and tear through the soft skin of the bomber. Those were the black smoke puffs you can see on World War II footage. They may look harmless, but within some 40 feet radius around each puff, about 10,000 high-velocity fragments, powered by the explosion of one kilogram of explosive inside the shell, were scattered, and they were more than capable of downing the B-17 Flying Fortress. The closer they explode to the bomber, logically, the greater the danger is for it. Even near misses could tear off a wing, knock out engines, sever fuel or oil lines, and cause fire. Not to mention what the shrapnel would do to a B-17's crew inside. Armor could be added just around the most critical components, and most of the bomber was made from aluminum and plexiglass. If a flak shell exploded near the cockpit, 
it would horribly tear up the pilots and instruments, and that was it for the bomber. A direct hit by a flak shell would almost certainly be the end for the flying fortress. However, the B-17 gained a reputation as very difficult to kill. There were many cases where bombers returned from their missions with two out of four engines out and entire sections of wings and fuselage missing. There are even instances of surviving a direct flak hit into the cabin when pilots somehow managed to fly the plane back with a completely blown off cockpit. They went to lower altitude where there was more oxygen so they wouldn't faint and came into range of all lighter anti-aircraft weapons and still only its crew knowing how they managed to reach England flying wounded in this barely airworthy plane. However, many others were not so fortunate and when I say many, I mean thousands. But putting those shells close to bombers was the hardest part for German flak crews. They had Commando Garret 36, which was for the time an ingenious device. To it were connected by cables all the guns in the battery, and it could control all of them simultaneously by feeding the firing information to operators, then firing all guns at once through it. The problem, however, was the technology at the beginning of the war, which lacked the ability to actually determine the right range and altitude of bombers, and then to set shells to explode just there. Before the radar, this was done mostly by guesswork and, well, luck. However, this would drastically change in a few short but turbulent years ahead of them. Before the Allied bombing campaign began, some 2,600 early Flak 18s in service didn't have much job of shooting down aircraft. This was mostly done with the fighters we mentioned, the BF-109, which cut through mostly older aircraft with not much trouble. But anti-aircraft defense would all of a sudden become the top priority when Operation Point Blank began. The first combat use of the B-17 Flying Fortress actually came with the British Royal Air Force in mid-1941. Brits got the early C and D models that gave them quite disappointing results. They didn't have a tail gunner, which turned out to be a crucial mistake when German fighter interceptors attacked them, and they also lacked armour around critical components. This didn't go well with the flak exploding around them. These issues were quickly addressed in subsequent models, stacking on more guns and more armour, with the G model eventually reaching 13 50 caliber machine guns in various turrets and positions. Machine guns were intended to protect the bombers from enemy fighters, and to multiply their firepower, because the B-17 was quite stable to fly and had the first early form of autopilot, they would arrange huge formations of tens of bombers flying all tightly together. They would have wings tucked under and above one another. Flying in such formation made it much more dangerous for German fighters to attack them. Although flying fortresses accounted for a significant number of shot down German fighters, this protection wasn't enough to protect them completely, and they, in return, also suffered tremendous losses from the fighters. But, as you heard how the flak works, flying in formation reduced risks from enemy fighters, but only increased it when it comes to flak. In 1943, US 8th Air Force, flying off from bases in England, began a sustained offensive on targets deep in German-held territory with hundreds of B-17s. The British were experimenting with bombing raids before the Americans, and they quickly learned that daylight raids were a huge no-no, exactly because of enemy fighter interceptors and flak. They shifted to night raids, sacrificing bombing precision, and turning more to terror bombing, attacking German cities more than industry. But the Americans were convinced that with their Norden bomb site that promised revolutionary accuracy and heavily armed and armored flying fortresses, they could survive in daylight. They would compensate for additional risk with surgically accurate raids on Germany's most crucial factories for sustaining the war, especially for aircraft production. If they could cut the head off the Luftwaffe, Germany's powerful air force, they'd have complete air superiority and make the war much shorter, fighting unopposed from the air. Well, that was the theory. In practice, over 8,000 bombers were shot down, with 40% of their crews killed throughout the war, while about 70% of the bombs hit everything but their intended targets. But the Germans were not going to let this happen easily, so in just two weeks of operations, more than 200 bombers were lost during deep raids over Germany, and the whole concept of strategic bombing quickly came into question whether it should be cancelled. But they pushed through stubbornly at the expense of thousands of young crews' lives. Because the Allies now stepped up their bombing missions around the clock, alternating with British bombing by night and Americans during the day, the Germans knew they had to do something in response. 
they redeployed elite fighters from the Eastern Front and began encircling their most important factories and cities with belts of flak cannons. But the flak now was no longer the old, guesswork-guided flak 18 from the beginning of the war. The 88s were refined and improved, and now the flak 36 and 37 became significantly deadlier for flying fortresses in daylight. Besides higher velocity shells for the 88s, the Germans also introduced heavier guns in 10.5 and 12.8 centimeter calibers, but they were in smaller numbers. However, the biggest breakthrough came when the new fire control unit was paired with radar. As we said, early in the war, the Germans didn't have a precise way to estimate range and altitude, then set time fuses precisely, because the Germans never fielded proximity radio fuses that would automatically burst the shell when it reached close to the aircraft. The Allies managed to develop this technology in 1943, and it is estimated to be 50 times more effective than time fuses, so it was an extremely guarded secret. Okay, so now we'll explain this German system that is perhaps too deep if you're not weird like me to find it fascinating. Germany instead began building a far more advanced, centralized fire control system designed to predict where a bomber would be by the time a shell reached its height. A well-trained 88 crew could fire 15 to 20 rounds per minute, which meant that a single battery of four guns could fill the sky with shrapnel very quickly. But the shell took about one second to climb 1,000 feet, so to reach a bomber flying at 27,000 feet, it needed around 27 seconds of flight time. During that time, the bombers were moving forward at roughly 200 miles per hour. If a gunner simply aimed at where the bomber was when he fired, the shell would explode miles behind it. So the Germans had to lead the target, meaning they had to aim not where the bomber was, but where it would be almost half a minute later because they had just a short time window during which their fire was most effective, and because various complicated calculations needed to be done quickly and continuously adjusted as the bomber formation moved, they created a system of connected instruments. At the heart of this system was a mechanical computer called the Commando Garret 36, which was introduced before the war, but a much improved Model 40 entered large-scale use from 1941. Each heavy flak battery was connected by cables to a central control trailer that housed this computer and its crew. The setup also included a stereoscopic rangefinder, a device with twin lenses about four meters apart that measured how far away the target was. At the same time, several men looked through telescopic sights that tracked the bomber's angle and direction in the sky. As the crew turned handwheels to keep the bomber centered in their sights, Commando Garret's internal gears and cams continuously converted that movement into mathematical data, calculating the bomber's speed, direction, altitude, and rate of climb or descent. All this information was combined inside the Commando Garret to predict exactly where the bomber would be when the shell reached it. The computer also adjusted for wind, air density, and the time it took the shell to travel. The results were sent electrically to dials mounted on each gun, and the gunners simply turned their controls until their needles matched the readings from the computer. They then set the fuse rings on the shells so that they would explode at the predicted time and altitude. This was now far faster and more accurate than trying to make the same calculations by hand. Once everything was set, the guns could be fired simultaneously, sending a salvo of shells into the predicted point of the sky. The guns could also be set to fire automatically the moment a shell was loaded to speed up the rate of fire. The goal was to have multiple bursts form a deadly pattern through which the bombers would have to fly. At first, this system was based entirely on visual observation, but as the Allies began bombing at night or through cloud cover, Germany integrated radar into the system. The Freyer early warning radar could detect bomber formations at long range, and once they were in range of the guns, a second radar, the Würzburg, locked onto a single aircraft and tracked it with far greater precision. The larger Würzburg Riesa used a 7.5 meter dish and could follow a single bomber out to 70 kilometers with an accuracy of about 25 meters. The radar's data, which was now much more accurate than the data acquired by those early devices, was then sent in the same way directly to the Commando Garret, which then calculated the firing solution and sent the results to the guns. This combination of radar, rangefinder, and mechanical computer now allowed German flak batteries to engage bombers accurately even in darkness or bad weather, which had been almost impossible before. In the early stages of the bombing war, when radar-guided fire control first came into use, German defences were deadly, but they still relied on volume of fire to be effective. 
At this point, on average, around 4,000 flak shells were fired for every bomber shot down. Now this number might sound high, but as the Allies' countermeasures improved, this number became four times higher, so this advantage didn't last long. The Allies quickly developed countermeasures to confuse or blind the German radar. The British dropped so-called window, which were basically clouds of thin aluminum strips that created thousands of false echoes on radar screens. Later, the Allies began using electronic jamming codenamed Carpet, which filled radar receivers with noise and made it impossible to track targets accurately. As these measures spread, German gunners were forced to fall back on optical tracking and manual prediction again, which greatly reduced accuracy. The Allied bombers also adapted their tactics. They began flying in even larger, denser formations and climbed to higher altitudes near or above 30,000 feet. At those heights, flak accuracy naturally decreased. Bombers also performed planned evasive maneuvers, making previously agreed changes in course and altitude to confuse German observers. Bomber crews were instructed never to fly straight for more than 30 seconds before changing direction or altitude by at least 20 degrees and 500 feet. These changes prevented the German fire control computers from completing an accurate prediction cycle. Because if you remember, the shell needed about 30 seconds to reach them. So if they changed altitude every 30 seconds, it was much harder to predict where they'd be and flak shells would be exploding below or above the bomber formation. When radar and predictors failed, the Germans resorted to barrage fire which was a crude but still deadly tactic. Instead of precisely calculating where the bombers would be, gunners basically fired blindly into a wide area with shells set to explode at various altitudes. This way, the volume of fire would guarantee that at least some shells would hit their target. This now turned both Allied evasive maneuvers and German calculations into one big game of lucky or unlucky shots, depending on which side you were on. As the war dragged on, and with skilled anti-aircraft crews mostly killed, the average number of flak shells fired per downed Allied bomber was around 16,000. But because the Germans fired millions of them, they were still very dangerous to the bombers. And by the way, flak crews had quite a high casualty rate of an estimated 70% or more because they were always positioned around valuable targets that saw a lot of bombing raids. By the end of the war, the majority of flak crews were actually made from women, children and old people, as pretty much everyone else was either dead, wounded or busy fighting the collapsing front line. Then, as the war turned into its final, darkest and most desperate chapters, these things were used as the very last line of defence. These were flak towers, enormous, fortress-like concrete structures built around Germany's most important cities. The idea came directly from Adolf Hitler himself, after the first British air raids on Berlin in 1940. He wanted something that could defend the capital against mass air attacks, something that could not be destroyed easily and that could serve as both a shelter and a stronghold. Each flak tower complex was made from the so-called combat tower and the control tower. The combat tower was the main gun platform, rising about 40 meters high, with walls three and a half meters thick to withstand direct hits from 500 pound bombs. On top sat several heavy anti-aircraft guns, with smaller caliber guns for shooting down low-flying aircraft. The control tower housed radar and the fire control system, and the weapons could also be turned against ground targets. It was basically a huge medieval fortress on steroids. The interior was divided into multiple floors that could serve as air raid shelters for civilians, housing up to 10,000 people during raids, along with ammunition storage rooms, command centers, hospitals, and even animal shelters for the nearby zoos. The thick concrete walls made them some of the safest places in Germany during bombing raids. Berlin had three such flak towers that created a protective umbrella above the city. However, it still wasn't enough to protect it against the huge, ever-increasing number of Allied raids. They were the last point of resistance when the battle came into Berlin itself in the very last days of World War II in Europe. They were firing flak guns at advancing Soviet tanks until the final collapse. Most of them were demolished after the war, but some of them still stand and are turned into museums you can visit.